I always feel a bit concerned when people applaud at the beginning before they see me talk, because I kind of feel like the only way is down from then on in. So, uh, all right. Uh, yeah, as Sven said, I did uh, write a book about microservices, um, which doesn't contain any reference to serverless, uh, which made me feel like I had to do something to address this uh, particular challenge. Um, but this is what we're here to learn about today. Well, well, that's what I've been trying to learn about the last year or so, is what on earth is this thing called serverless? There's the book you can see. No serverless information in the book. Um, I used to work for a bunch of other companies. I now run my own firm uh, called Sam Newman & Associates. We do training, consultancy, and advisory work. I've also been doing some uh, workshops uh, on microservices. Some of you I know in the room were in our, the two workshops we had earlier this week. And it's been a big year uh, uh, for me, a very big year for me, because you know, starting, starting my own firm, was, was, that was a big deal. Um, uh, and you know, uh, it, it's been... <sighs> Look, I'm not going to lie to you. The reason it's been a big year is because I've suddenly realized that I'm 40. And that's been... Like, I, people in my class will tell you firsthand that I was sitting down for half of yesterday uh, because my back is so bad. I now make sounds when I get up out of my seat. I make large, louder sounds when I sit back down in my seat. Getting up out of a chair is amongst the worst things that can happen to me in any given day. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when the internet came on a floppy disk. This isn't actually a floppy disk, but it did used to come on bigger floppy disks. I couldn't find a good AOL picture of those. I was very excited when I, my modem went up to being a 14.4K modem. We still had to deal with the issue that you're trying to use the internet and somebody else wants to use the phone, and you know your dad picks the phone up and it's screeching in their ear. Uh, so yes, this is when I, I remember the internet. I remember when... Facebook used to be called The Facebook, which is what I insist on calling it. I also insist on not using it because I don't understand it. Um, but yes, that's what, yes, this is the past. And now, of course, we live in the future, a future of Snapchat. So I don't really understand Snapchat either. You know, all I know is that every now and then my, my, son will be, my son will be sitting on the sofa. He'll make a funny face in his camera and go, and take a photograph. I don't understand what it is, nor do I understand how it's a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, now, I'm, this is the thing, right? No, I'm not that old. I suppose in the computing terms, the fact that I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years plus years now does make me a bit old. But I still feel like I am in touch with some things. I do have some of a basis in reality. I uh, was fortunate enough to, be, to use Amazon Web Services extremely early on. I sort of accidentally found myself delivering the first public training courses for AWS years and years ago, my old colleague uh, Chris Reed. And so I feel like on this cloud stuff, I've got a firm grasp, and I should be able to understand this world we operate in. I spend lots of my time with cloud platforms that make it easier for people to go faster. I love helping people go faster. That's kind of what I want to do. Uh, those of you who should have uh, been here to see Steve's talk earlier all about that. How do you optimize your flow, and that got me really excited. You know, infrastructure automation, build automation, test automation, all of those things led me to microservices, and that's my thing. And then everyone starts saying, oh, you've, you're have you not serverless, though, are you? You're not serverless. <laughs> oh, no, you're not. You've still got servers? And I'm very concerned about that, but I got confused, because what does it mean? I am somebody who is half a system administrator and half a developer, more by accident than by design. Uh, when you turn out to be the only person on a project that knows Unix, you end up being the build monkey. And next thing you know, you're the system administrator. I quite enjoyed that, though. So I understand there are definitely computers here, right? But the term itself, of course, is serverless. Now, serverless is coming up fast on the Gartner hypometer. We can see the Gartner hypometer here. Uh, here's my own particular topic of microservices. I want to point out I am winning on this anyway. Right There's my little blip right up there. This might be a bit old now. Um, I always find it funny that microservices is way up here and service-oriented architecture is way down there, and they're the same things. So it is all just marketing. And serverless, you see over there, is still a technology trigger, um, which, well, we'll see. I suspect we're getting, I think, the peak the peak for microservices is going to be dwarfed by the peak of interest into serverless computing later on. But I started wading my way through all this, trying to work out what the hell is it? What are the impact in a microservice environment? What does it mean? Uh, and, and, and so, you know, of course, I had to deal with the initial challenge, which was, 
well, there are definitely computers here, right? So what, what is this thing really, really about? Now, it might surprise some of you, but uh, the term serverless has actually been around for quite a long time. Uh, it's only really been maybe in the common consciousness of us for maybe the last couple of years. But the term actually treats its way, comes all the way back to uh, this article in 2012, and unfortunately it seems my slides are being sliced off. Um, this is a, a, a piece by Ken from back in 2012 uh, about serverless computing. This is the earliest reference I could find. I found this via Mike Roberts. And the definition Ken used for serverless computing, this is his observation of kind of the new generation of cloud-based services. And he talked about what he saw as this new type of service, uh, these serverless types of platforms. And his definition for serverless was this. The phrase serverless doesn't mean that so servers are no longer involved. It simply means that developers no longer have to think that much about them. Computing resources get used as services without ha having to manage around physical capacities or limits. So this was serverless as a definition. It's still a good definition, I think, at some level. 2012 predates it. Now, the interesting thing is I've been to a number of talks this year about serverless computing that start off by defining serverless and saying, serverless is just functions as a service. That's all it is. That's all you've got to think about it, which, of course, is hogwash because Lambda launched in 2014, a full two years after the term serverless was coined. So that's not really it either. Uh, we do, though, have to deal with the fact that all of this stuff is about your viewpoint. This is a developer-focused uh, wave of services, which I think is really important. It's really valuable. These things are serverless from our point of view, from developers' point of view. Right? The platform is amazing. It makes us feel great and empowered. It makes us feel like, yes, we can do whatever we want. I don't have to worry about pesky computers or administration purposes or whatever else. It's just, it's just handled for me. And of course, underneath all of it are sitting our servers. And maybe, maybe as well, poor operations people that have got no idea what the hell's going on with all the developers running around saying, why can't it be serverless all the time? And it is all about, this is all about things being in the eye of the beholder. Things do get very confusing. You think things are great and rosy in your world, but really, not so much. The reality is that most of us are only experiencing service platforms at the moment, though, via cloud vendors, from Amazon, from Microsoft, whoever else. That means this underlying management stuff is being hidden, very much hidden from us. We just get recharged those costs. I don't think that's going to continue. Now, I went looking for a better definition of what serverless architectures were, and I came back to uh, this post by Mike Roberts. So Mike Roberts is an old colleague of mine, and has written this really lovely post talking all about different types of microservice architectures. It's available over at Martin Fowler's site. I thoroughly recommend giving it a read. But I was chatting to Mike about this and said, look, are there any more sort of defined characteristics that you've got for what serverless means? Is it just you don't have to worry about servers. And Mike's actually got a fairly specific set of criteria that he uses to decide this thing is serverless. These are the defining characteristics of what makes for a serverless product, a serverless platform. So the first thing he talks about is that there's no management of server hosts or server processes. That's very clear. I'm not worried about how many of these things I've got or what it is. I'm not doing operating system upgrades. That's hidden from me entirely. Secondly, this idea that the platform itself should auto-scale or spin up new things, and therefore also probably shut those down, based on my need without me having to be involved. Thirdly, you get charged based on precise usage. So you're, based, you're charged based on what you use, how you use a service. You're not charged if, it's, if you're not using it. Right? Fourth, the performer's capabilities you don't define those in terms of like host size or host count. Again, this, this, this kind of implies that that auto-scale and auto-provisioning is, is, again, it's very abstracted. You don't say, when I hit load, add another machine. You don't get that level of control. So the thing to understand with all of this stuff, which is serverless is about higher order abstractions, higher order abstractions can remove control from you. You kind of have to be OK with that. And finally, there's this idea that serverless gives you implicit high availability. 
In other words, you don't have to apply conscious thought, you just get high availability as a side effect of using the serverless product. And that's actually quite an attractive option, right? Now, we'll come back to that concept of high availability a bit later on. So, if we use Mike's criteria, there are some obvious products out there that fit that model really, really well, okay? We've got things like Lambda and uh, Azure Cloud Functions. So, these things are function as a service, which for many people are synonymous with serverless to the extent where serverless means function as a service. But Mike's definitions actually do pull in a whole load of other products that also fit the bill really well. Amazon Dynamo or Google's Bigtable, Amazon's S3, those are all serverless platforms. You're not worried about the underlying computers. You're not managing in terms of hosts. You're being charged based on usage. Um, zero admin, those also absolutely fit the bill of serverless architectures. These, these sorts of things are often called back-end as a storage, typically the database types products in their space. Now, serverless being around abstractions, I started thinking about what was you know, my favorite developer-oriented abstraction for quite a while, and what I still think to a great degree is the gold standard for developer-focused platform as a service, and that's Heroku. Really interestingly, as awesome as Heroku is, it doesn't fit Mike's bill or Mike's definition of what serverless is because you're still managing in terms of things like host counts. You could also argue that you're spinning up a machine, you're spinning up a dynamo, for example. That dynamo is sitting there, you're still being charged for it whether or not it's taking on load. So Heroku doesn't fit the bill. There are some other odd things, though, that do fit the bill which makes me think this is always the challenge when you have a very specific set of selection criteria that you, you, un, you unwittedly pull some things in. Salesforce, specifically the force.com platform, is a serverless platform. Might not be one that you want to use necessarily, although I suspect every single one of you is in a company that is using it very heavily somewhere. But yeah, Salesforce's force.com platform absolutely would apply as a serverless architecture in this world. Not scaling in terms of hosts, you could argue about the pricing model, but it fits in some ways better than Heroku does. Fastly, a content delivery network, that's serverless. You're not managing that plane. You can even use Fastly to deploy applications if you've got just a client-only JavaScript application. You're being charged based on usage. You're not managing hosts. That fits. And as I mentioned, I think sort of the... Uh, the sort of predecessor for all of these serverless uh, uh, type platforms, arguably, is something like Amazon's S3. A really simple, easy to use, highly available blob store. This is all about abstractions. Serverless is just all about abstractions. And we've been going through this journey for a while now. We started off with the journey towards infrastructure as a service, the ability to create a line of code and have that automatically provision some piece of infrastructure. Arguably, this is an abstraction which is ops-friendly more than developer-friendly, but nonetheless, it's there. You know, we've got infrastructure as a service. More recently, we've been looking at what some people have called containers as a service. Really, that should be container orchestration as a service. Platforms that, are, that abstract out the detail of how you manage and scale container-based applications. So think of things like um, Amazon uh, ECS, think of things like Kubernetes, the various different offerings out there. Uh, Mesos and those things fit into that as well. A higher order abstraction, a friendlier abstraction. Now, 10 years ago, if you'd asked me what direction this whole thing was going in, I would have said that all of us by now would be using a platform as a service. When I first saw Heroku, it was like, eyes open, it's like, obviously, that's what we should all be using, or something very like it. Turns out, Working out what a good developer abstraction is at that level, at the level of a, of a platform, at the level of a pure abstraction around an application, is really difficult. This is always the issue with abstractions. The higher the abstraction you create, hopefully the easier it is to use, but you often hide detail and hide information you shouldn't hide. You end up with leaky abstractions or abstractions that hide too much information from you. And that's why it's taken so long, I think, for us to start coming up with these higher order abstractions that actually make sense for most of us. For me, platform as a service is still the future, it's still where we're going, and serverless is really just a better encapsulation of what that is. But nonetheless, we're now drowning in acronyms. We've got fast, pass, pass, cas, ass, serverless sits up this, you know, Kubernetes, 
up there as well, and it's all getting a bit confusing, and I don't really know what's going on anymore, and you know, at parties talking about what you do for a living, and you end up feeling like a bit of an ass. It, it gets really, look, this is all I need to think about. It's all about abstraction. It's all about hiding away detail that isn't important to you. I mean, Kelsey gets it. And if you don't follow the awesome Kelsey Hightower, you should. He's been one of the driving forces behind making Kubernetes like such a big part of, of many of our lives nowadays. You know, this is his, this is his view on what, on what serverless is. You don't want to have to worry about infrastructure. You don't want to have to worry about admin. You want to write your code and get on with your day job. Now, I don't think serverless computing can hide all things from us, but it can hide a lot. I still though, like coming back to that original definition from 2012 from Ken. The phrase serverless doesn't mean servers are no longer involved. There's still computers underneath it all. Don't worry. Servers are no longer involved. It simply means that developers no longer have to think that much about them. This is just a continuation of the work that's been going on for many years now by many different people. Some of you may have heard this term before, undifferentiated heavy lifting. This is the term that was used at Amazon to describe a lot of the busy work that their teams were being asked to do. Amazon had this driver towards autonomous teams, so reducing the need for coordination between teams, allowing those teams to operate and execute and deliver quickly. But they had to sort of self-service as much stuff as possible. They wanted to be able to manage their own infrastructure so they could, wouldn't need a centralized operations team but they found them spending, they were spending all of their time racking kit, cabling, talking to vendors. And they said, this is undifferentiated heavy lifting. What we do doesn't differentiate ourselves from anybody else. We need something else to handle this for us. That's what drove the creation of the product, of the, of the uh, infrastructure as a service stuff that they developed internally that eventually became what we now use with via AWS. All that's happening is we're developing a different idea of what undifferentiated heavy lifting is for us as application developers. It's higher order undifferentiated heavy lifting. It might not be computers anymore that we're trying to abstract over. Now it's functions. Now it's databases. In Mike's definition, he talks about this idea that serverless was inherently highly available. I want to push on that point just a little bit and talk about that aspect of resiliency, and, and some areas where I think serverless does still have some questions that need to be resolved. Uh, now, many, many years ago, I uh, played a very small part in the global financial crisis. Um, if you want to know more about the details of how I did this, you can watch the film The Big Short. I'm obviously being played by Brad Pitt. Uh, <laughs> In reality, what I was doing was pricing, helping price these things called uh, credit derivatives. One type of this was a collateralized debt obligation. And the collateralized debt obligation was, very simply put, a type of financial product where you took looks of bad loans and you put them all together and then you said, and now it's all good. And then you'd ask the question, well, how does that work? And they say, you put all the bad loans together and then they're good. What part of this don't you understand? <laughs> And then you just got on with the job. Um, so do go read, especially the book by Martin Lewis that the film's based on is really interesting. Uh, now, this system was, really, in, was re really fun to build. And a lot of the work that you know, I plowed into microservices since have, was inspired on this project. We were actually delivering our solution on this interesting thing called a, uh, a, a, a grid, a, a computing grid. Uh, this was back in the days where you know, we were talking about grid computing, not talking about things like Hadoop and all that sort of stuff that came later damn hipsters. Um, instead, we had a good old-fashioned uh, sort of grid computing system. We were using one called Data Synapse. And the idea was that you'd run a whole lot of workers in this grid, and you could dispatch work to that, and you would use the grid to scale up and down the number of machines you had. We were running on our own, our own kit. At the time, it was pretty, it, we were one of the first people in London to do this, um, so it was really exciting. Nowadays, people go, you only had 25 machines? Oh, bless. Uh, but nonetheless, here was all of our things that were pricing our trades, but we needed information from other sources. So we were pulling in information on different risk profiles. A lot of that was coming from Bloomberg and things. We we're also pulling in general market data, so information about companies that might look like they're going bust, that sort of stuff. And then we were storing the information that we'd, when we'd done these calculations, we were storing that information out into a database. And all of those things were external services that lived outside of this grid. Now, the reason we'd picked this grid, by the way, 
uh, this particular product is this product had the ability to run Excel spreadsheets in the server. Now, you might think, why would you want to run Excel spreadsheets on the server side? Well, that's when I tell you that for a long time, lots of the traders were actually running these pricing algorithms in Excel spreadsheets on their machines. And when they didn't like the answers, because, for example, the answers might mean they didn't get a good bonus, they would just change the numbers until it fitted what they wanted to do. The bank worked out that wasn't a great idea and decided to centralize a lot of that work. So we had to be able to move, run these Excel spreadsheets on a central farm. Another interesting capability of this particular product was that you could run the agents just as screensavers. So if on a normal desktop machine, the machine wasn't being used, the screensaver started up, that machine would then become available as part of the pricing grid, allowing you to really like scale up the number of workers that you had. And so a colleague of us told us uh, about the fact that we actually had a whole DR center sort of north of, uh, north of London, the idea being that if the building had to get evacuated, that the traders could move to the new location and carry on doing their work. These machines had to be left on as part of the sort of business continuity planning, and so these machines were always available. And so he told us this in hushed tones at lunchtime. And he goes, we could, just, uh, we could just install the screensaver. They wouldn't mind. It'd be fine. So we did that. So we suddenly went from having a grid that had like about 25 machines to having a grid of about 300 machines. And it worked really well to begin with. The grid handled it beautifully. And it just spun up all these extra machines. And we started chewing through this work way, way faster. And then some really interesting things started to happen. And as if from nowhere, everything stopped working. We realized that what we had done is overloaded every single service that wasn't in the grid. We were generating too much load on the services that we were extracting information from. And we completely nuked the database. Uh, so this was a cautionary tale. We actually had to back off the number of nodes we had and start working out how we could increase the scale of the things around our system. We basically had a, a, mismatch, a mismatch capacity problem. Now, we actually deal with sort of mismatch capacity problems and in, in our systems all the time. We actually build throttling mechanisms into our systems all the time. Sometimes we don't even know we're doing it, but it happens. Like one of the traditional ways you might do this is something like a database connection pool. When we have a connection pool to handle connections down to the database, that limits how many calls will go through to the underlying database system itself. So you can stop it being overwhelmed. You can actually shrink the connection pool size of each service. And these work really nicely. You have load coming in. If they need access to the database, so if a request needs to get some information from the database, it goes and gets a worker from the pool. If, the one, if a worker is available, that request can then go on. If, that, if a worker isn't available, then the request has to block and wait until one is. And in this way, you're throttling the number of calls that go through to a database, protecting the database, and allowing it to continue to work. So these connection pools, they help throttle the load. It also allows you, if you can't get an, a worker out of the database, perhaps because there's so much load going on, you can actually shed load as well. You effectively can time out on waiting for a, a thread from the connection pool, and you shed load, which actually sheds load off the whole system. It reduces resource. Uh, contention and increases the stability of your software. Whether we realize it or not, that's the role the, connection, uh, the database connection pooling plays in our systems and our applications. The problem is connection pools require continual state between requests. There is a pool. That pool is shared amongst lots of requests. When we start looking at some of the serverless stuff, though, that, those things don't quite work, do they? Because what we have is we have something like a function as a service offering, like we're using Lambda or, or, or something else. When requests come in, we launch a function that allows us to carry out some operation. The more requests that come in, the more functions that get executed to handle those requests. So more load, more functions. Those functions, if they want to talk to our database, will increase the number of calls coming in. There is no place here for a throttling mechanism. At best, you can throttle right at the top-ish in terms of limiting the number of invocations you've got. But even then, you don't have much fidelity of control. And so I started wondering, are we going to have the same problem with function as a service as we do with something like what well, we had with that pricing system I showed earlier? In other words, if you get high load, are you going to basically end up nuking downstream databases just like we did? Now, of course, the answer here is, well, don't use a normal database to back your functions as a service. You use a serverless database. 
you use Bigtable or you use Dynamo because those things are serverless systems that will scale as your functions scale. And that's sort of OK to a point, but then I have the question, well, what about hybrid applications? I, I hate the idea of Big Bang rewrites. I think it's one of the worst things we do in our industry. There's a huge amount of problems associated with Big Bang rewrites. So I always try and promote the idea of incremental evolution of software. So if you want to move and adopt to serve some serverless products to make your life easier, you're going to need to be able to migrate from your existing setup over to a serverless architecture. And so the idea that you have to be all in on serverless to solve these resiliency problems don't, doesn't sit well with me. I also was worried, though, that I could just, this could just be a theoretical problem. Until I heard, uh, saw a great presentation uh, by um, uh, Steve from Bustle. So Bustle are a quite successful uh, online media company in the US. I think they do something like 60 million uniques. And they're often held up as being the poster, the poster children for pure serverless. The reality is Bustle are not pure serverless, despite what some of the case studies might lead you to believe. That's the vendor case studies. That's not necessarily what Bustle themselves will tell you. Bustle run Redis on the back end as a database. Now, putting aside whatever concerns you have about running Redis as a database, it works really well for them. But they were having all kinds of interesting problems. They were having the same issue that we'd had. They were seeing their database, their Redis instances, being completely overloaded by these Lambda functions that were being spun up. They were actually seeing some really odd things. Their Redis instances were topping out at 10,000 concurrent connections. And they were running on AWS. And at the time, you were limited to 1,000 Lambda function invocations at a time. So clearly, the old functions were lying around, and those old connections were lying around. They ended up having to do some really funky stuff down at the actual Redis node to get rid of connections that weren't active, just to try and keep those systems running. So this is actually a real-world problem in terms of getting your implicit high availability. This isn't implicit high availability to me. It feels like we've lost something by not having that connection pooling idea somewhere in the system. There are other kinds of resiliency protection mechanisms that we use, of course, in these situations. Circuit breakers being a common one. Another kind of throttling mechanism. Another kind of protection mechanism that we use to ensure resiliency in systems that use synchronous point-to-point -point calls. And again, you know, it works in a similar way. Load comes in. If I, my service or my application needs to make a downstream call to something, and that downstream service is misbehaving, maybe it's erroring, maybe it's timing out, what we do is we open the circuit breaker in order that, that, in the order that we start failing fast. Failing fast is useful because it reduces resource contention, makes sure our system stays resilient. That then allows us to get rid of the load. We go to failing fast. Circuit breakers rely on state across requests. It's how many timeouts have I had in a certain period of time, how many errors have I had in a certain period of time before I consider that downstream service is unhealthy. Circuit breakers live in client code. Where do they live in our functions? So that's always been a question to me. It's like, where is this? What I've been thinking about is actually, if we are going to continue using functions as a service, are we actually going to end up with some kind of throttling and load shedding middleware that will sit between our functions, which are single request and ephemeral, and those parts of our applications that might need protection from them? Increasingly, I'm wondering if this is potentially where service meshes will be able to help. The challenge, of course, is that most service meshes are positioned at different types of problems, and I don't necessarily know how easy it would be to make that stuff work and ensure that you route via them, but I, I intend to find out. Of course, I could be worrying how many people here have massively scalable systems. You know, how many of us really have the kind of problems that require a massive, huge scale that can dynamically provision stuff? Maybe that's not the point. If you're running small loads, then maybe the stuff I'm talking about here isn't going to be a problem to you. But then that is the promise of this stuff, is that we don't have to worry about resiliency in these situations. And, and clearly, we kind of do. And I'm not entirely sure there's, the answers are out there. And I have been talking to people who spend all of their time working in serverless and saying, so what about these things? And they go, yep, that's a problem. I say, so what do you do about it? And they go, yep, that's a problem, isn't it? Yep. <sighs> so maybe next year, we'll have a solution to all of this. I want to try and catch up with the Bustle team and find out what they're doing. But, you know, this may or may not be an impact for you. Another thing that gets talked about a lot is security. 
And initially, at least, there were a lot of concerns, specifically around function as a service and what the security model is. Because very quickly, when Lambda first got launched, people worked out, ah, it's running Docker under the hood. It's just a container. My function is really a container. And as we've all been told time and time again, is that friends don't let friends run untrusted code in containers. Because there are, although containers are quite good isolation mechanisms, they're not necessarily a very secure way in general to isolate code from different people where those people don't trust each other. So this has always been the mantra, so you want VM isolation, or if you're lucky enough to be a Microsoft, you can use something like vSphere containers. But nonetheless, normally we say we don't want, to we don't want a multi-tenant code from different people who don't know each other because your trust models are kind of out of whack. The reality is, of course, what we're worried about is a very, very specific targeted type of attack. What we're saying here is, well, somebody else's function could do something to my function or access my data somehow. Let's imagine how that's going to work, though. I'm got, you know, when I launch a function, that's a container that's going to spin up on some machine, and I don't get to decide what machine that function is going to launch on. That function will only run for as long as it's you know, needed. The, an, an attacker has to get their function onto the same machine, breach the protections that are in that system, and then somehow find my function and gain access to it. So beyond the fact this makes a targeted attack incredibly difficult, it's more likely to be a mass market attack, the, if your function isn't running, it's not there. You know, and you're running in a sandbox anyway. You're not running out for containers. When you deploy a function, that function is deployed into something which itself is part of a container. So there are additional protections and sandboxing around your function onto the container itself. I will say it's kind of true, this, by the way. Just because your function isn't running doesn't mean it isn't there. It's not quite true. We know that um, at least Amazon Lambda, for example, keeps around functions. Uh, especially certain like Java functions to decrease the spin-up time. You know, I told you about Bustle having those 10,000 connections coming into their Redis instances, but you can only have a thousand functions running at a time. What does that tell you? It tells you there's something running somewhere. So we don't exactly know. All we know really is that if your function isn't running, we're not getting charged, which we're normally okay with. So security-wise. I think we're in a significantly better place in terms of stateless functionality with a function as a service platform. The fact that your code isn't running, therefore can't be attacked, is a good thing. I think also because people are mostly writing small functions, that's a small piece of code to, to look at and understand what it's doing. The flip side, of course, is you are pushing a lot of trust into the platform itself to do the right things. But that's happening anyway if you're embracing a platform. Talking of embracing platforms, we should talk about lock-in. A lot of people are very concerned about this. To buy into a service platform, you're buying into often the products from a certain vendor. And this has always been a problem from time immemorial when talking about cloud computing, because early on, we were promised it was all going to be utility. It's utility. It's not utility, is it? That's one of the dirtiest lies we were ever sold. There is no utility when it comes to computing, right? I'll tell you what utility is. When we talk about utility in the context of, of being able to shift between vendors, utility is what happens in the UK. We have a deregulated energy sector. No matter what you think about, if that's a good idea or not, switching providers is trivially simple. You go to somewhere like U-Switch, you put in your address and your postcode, you say how much you currently pay for electricity, and then it gives you a list of cheaper providers. You click a button, and in two days, you're now with a new provider. No one has to come and recable your house. No one has to go and change your electric sockets. It just sort of happens. It's like magic. It's like a utility should be. The reality is when you're moving from cloud vendor to cloud vendor, these, uh, these things aren't the same level of abstraction. We don't have the same level of abstraction as 240 hertz AC electric supplies. Right? The abstractions are all different, so moving from one vendor to another is not a seamless operation. It's not utility in that sense. This then gets people to start getting worried about lock-in. Oh, we're being locked in. Locking things in is bad. We don't want to be in a walled garden. You know what happens in walled gardens? I say, what? And they go, well, you know, and I really don't. But anyway, uh, I also get annoyed at this, because then what people start doing is tying themselves in knots to create their own abstractions over these cloud providers in order to theoretically allow them to maybe be portable later on, perhaps, maybe, if that happens, maybe, perhaps. Right? And so again, I urge you on the lock-in front, 
I don't like talking about lock-in. I instead like to think about the migration cost instead. Don't worry about being talk, talk about lock-in because that has always has negative connotations. Instead, try and have a rational conversation about what a potential migration might cost you in terms of the different services you might use because different services from each vendor has a different level of migration cost. If we think about something like you know, blob storage, like Amazon S3, the semantics of that offering are quite similar to offerings from other providers. Therefore, migrating over to an alternative blob storage provider, the biggest issue is actually going to be shifting the data. But the services are quite similar and are very close. Compute likely is a bit more work. The APIs you need to spin up an instance are different, because there really isn't a common standard around those things that's widely used. But once you're on the machine, you know, a Windows machine or a Linux machine run on, on Amazon is pretty much the same as one running on Azure once you've got it spun up. Load balances, the semantics are a bit different, but migration-wise, even if I couldn't use the cloud vendor, I could drop in HA proxy, and that's some work. It's not a lot. What the, the issue is more when you start getting into things like FAS, function as a service. The platforms are quite different. The, the, the capabilities of those platforms are quite different. So migrating that stuff is difficult because at the moment, there aren't that many solutions, and certainly none that I know of being used in production, that are portable functions as a service platforms. Backends as a service actually can be even more problematic. Here, the semantics are very different. There isn't another database in the world that has the semantics of DynamoDB, for example. So if you need to move your application into another platform, you may well actually have to rework code in order to use a different type of database. And this is what you really need to be thinking about. What it comes then down to is you make an assessment about migration costs, and then you sort of say to ourselves, well, look, if we have to move later on, this actually could be an awful lot of work. So do we want to use this service now? And what you're trying to do is have a trade-off between do I pay now, do I pay later? Do I pay the cost now of not using this awesome cloud service and using something else that isn't as good, or pay the cost of creating an abstraction over this awesome cloud service that might reduce my cost later on? Or do I say, you know what, we're going to take the risk, we're going to use it, and accept there might be a cost later on? This is what it should be. This is a balancing force. Do not get mixed up on trying to do things like you know, cloud arbitrage layers and stuff like that, because they're all rubbish because you end up with the lowest common denominator problem. Some people talk about mixing vendors to hedge your bets. Now, I think it makes a lot of sense as an organization to have a multi-cloud multi vendor strategy. Uh, one of the, my clients, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to them, and they said, they, yes, exactly what they do. Across the organization, they have strategically decided that they want to have investment in, like, um, I think they're using Microsoft, and they're using Google, and they're using uh, um, AWS. And they said, because as an organization, we want to have the skills in the organization to take advantage of the best services as they're rolled out, and potentially, if there's a big cost differential, to look at migrating services as appropriate. But within any given product area or solution, they are all in on one vendor, because they say the cost locally of trying to support multiple vendors is too high, beyond the, just the, the sort of fundamental challenges around things like latency and things like that. Ultimately, I come back to what I said earlier. You said that the walled garden, these pejorative terms we use. The thing is, when you're stuck in an ecosystem, we always assume it's a bad thing. But you know what? Being stuck in some places is pretty good, right? I quite like being in the apple walled garden. The apple walled garden is a really nice place to be. It's a beautifully manicured lawn. You've got a lovely babbling brook. People bring you drinks, and you're sipping martinis. You have a sauna. You can't get out, but it's nice. You really enjoy it. Yes, I've been in wall gardens where there's scorpions running around in the grass. There's a few snakes around. I think the, the house might collapse on me at any moment, but I'm not there now. Just because you're all in on a vendor, don't see that as necessarily a problem. And in fact, I think with all of these serverless platforms, you kind of have to be. You have to really embrace them, I think, to get the full benefits of them. Now, this is starting to change. People are now starting to create serverless um, uh, products that don't, aren't tied into vendors. Uh, I idly thought, I wonder, I bet, I bet somebody by now has uh, tried to come up with a fast framework for running on Kubernetes and Docker. It took me two minutes to find five that already exist. I know nothing about them, but you can, if you want to, go and use OpenFast. Uh, you can fa use FastNetis, uh, Fission, 
Uh, we also have Open WIC uh, from a, Open Whisk rather from Apache, uh, and of course Open Lambda, who I would imagine are going to get sued any moment now with that name. Uh, now the interesting thing for me is, again, serverless is way more than just that. And if all you have is function as a service, you're missing out on a lot of other things that you need. There are other problems in your application stacks that need to be dealt with. Beyond the, the problems I talked about with the, you know, the throttling middleware type stuff, which I think service meshes will solve. What about backend as a storage in a platform uh, portable manner? They, it turns out that's a way harder problem. Running containers in an ephemeral style is really easy, right? So therefore, these, fa these fast platforms are quite easy to create. Where is our equivalent of a DynamoDB or a Bigtable for running on our own Kubernetes instances? That's a significantly harder problem. And I doubt one we're going to see a good viable production solution for anytime soon. So look, I am, as any good technologist is, still very much confused. But I'm starting to make a bit more sense of it. I've sort of been quite fortunate that I've been around in a time in computing where we've gone through a few different phases of buzzwords, each which, one of which I've managed to take advantage of accidentally by being near somebody who knew something at the time. You know, we've had Agile, we've got DevOps, we've got microservices, and I've also realized that I mean, some people have sort of you know, seen that the pace of change in the world is, is increasing. You know, the time it takes for a new thing to have impact on our world has is, is, is really shifted. See how long it took for us to all have a, you know, a computer at home, and then see how long it took for us to all to have affected the power of that computer in our pocket, in a smartphone. It took a much less, shorter time. I think in the same way, we're seeing it with our buzzwords. Our buzzwords are going from being meaningful to meaningless in faster time than ever before. It took Agile like about 10 years, DevOps about five years, microservices about a year, and I think, well, serverless, maybe six months? If there's any advice I'm going to give you here, firstly, um, don't feel bad if you're not using serverless. It's just a lifestyle choice. There's some useful stuff out there. Um, there is an interesting question I've got about this hybrid stuff. Uh, we aren't, computers aren't going away, but we are adding computers faster than we're adding software developers and people that can use them. Therefore, these abstractions, these higher order abstractions, are vital in order to allow us to take advantage of those computers to do things. Serverless is just another evolution. It's all about abstractions. And as we've seen, we've got abstractions all the way down. The last thought is, with all of this, is that all of these abstractions, these serverless abstractions, they start off being tuned for the general case. That may or may not fit what you need. And if it doesn't fit what you need, you often have no choice but to use something else. But that's OK, because underneath that, You've got things like you know, container orchestration as a service. You've got things like databases and RDS that you can use directly. We have a wealth of tools available to us. And I just want you to think about the right tool for the right job. Don't be scared about embracing the platform. Uh, and above all, uh, buy my book. Um, we have got time for questions. Uh, if you, you, you can find out more information, I do blogging and stuff over my website. And you can find me on Twitter at, at Sam Newman. Thank you. Seven minutes? Yeah, I Where's Steve? Do, ha, you only had one minute. <laughs> Sorry? So I was having a go Steve. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's start with a very serious question. Oh, no. Can we have abstraction as a service? No, I'm just joking. It's, it's actually a question from, uh, from the app, but... Okay. Uh, so the land of serverless, as far as I understand, is confusing. Will it stay for longer or will it pass away? Uh... I mean, I, don't, I, I think the having zero admin uh, abstractions that allow us to de build and deploy our applications is absolutely here to stay. Whether or not the term serverless it survives, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it really matters that much. So I think we have got better at creating abstractions that find that balance between utility and ease of use. And so I think it's the banner term for those products that fit that space. So it's that those products are here to stay. I think we are probably have higher order abstractions to go. I think the idea that I should be able to throw an application at this system and it will work everything out for me. Um, so I think we might have higher order definitions of what my application is that we might be using. And that was the original premise of things like Google App Engine way, way back in the day. But what we found was it was too hard 
to work out what to do with your app because your app was special to you. So no, I think if anything, we'll probably see higher order abstractions being used more commonly over time. Okay, um, similar question. Why do you think pass is the future? Or maybe the same question. Uh, just because we should be. We shouldn't have to deal with the detail. I mean, this is, this is all about, and actually, you know, all computing, you know, since we began, has always been about creating higher order abstractions to make us more productive. That's why we don't write assembly code anymore. We came up with other languages that don't that handle that stuff for us. I think it's just our continuing desire to do more with the time we've got available to us. So what do you think um, of AWS IoT MQTT pricing? Because they do pricing by the number of messages, message size, stuff like that. Is that something? I know nothing about the inf information. Is it the information of toasters? Is that what IoT stands for? The information of toasters, yeah. I don't know about that specifically. Um, but one of the challenges associated with any of the pricing models being if you want to be charged based on precise usage, so you only get charged on what you use, it can make the world confusing because it's very hard to know what you're going to use. So I can't speak directly to that product, but one thing you need to consider is sometimes you might actually like to just get a load of EC2 instances to run your stuff on because then at least you have a known cost. And for some organizations, having a known upfront view of your cost rather than an unknown and hard to gauge understanding of your pricing might be a better choice for your organization. Okay. Thank you cool. very much. Thank you. Thank you.